Well, I think I, I think I heard the bell. Everybody doing okay? Yeah, on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we are picking up with our study after two weeks, right? A little bit of a hiatus. Uh, we welcomed all, not quite the interlopers, I guess we have adopted them for about six months, all those extra people. Uh, so uh, uh, everybody's in town now pretty much, and we're back with our study. Uh, we are promptly on track to get off kilter on Wednesday. On Wednesday, Jonathan Banning's going to teach down here. I'm going to go up and teach uh, the college class for Wednesday evening. I'm going to do that a couple of times and mostly be in here. So Jonathan's going to be in here on the 31st, which is Wednesday, and he's going to be teaching out of John 4, uh, if you want to be thinking ahead to that, out of John 4. So I'm trusting him with that. If he doesn't do well, let me know. You know, he's just a young guy. Sometimes he just needs a little bit of correction. Right? So I still have a paddle somewhere. If it reason, it got to come down to that. Uh, we are looking tonight in the synoptics uh, at the healing of the paralyzed man lowered through the roof, picking up sort of where we left off with in terms of chronology. So if you want to look uh, with me, probably the best place to look would be uh, Luke chapter 5. Uh, Matthew's the briefest account. Matthew's account is in chapter 9. But in Luke 5, I'll be picking up in uh, verse 17. You know, little kids learn about this uh, continually, it seems like, year to year in Bible classes, because it's a dramatic story. All the healings are. You know, they're dramatic stories. You'd like to think that no one started to take this stuff for granted. I I don't think they did. Uh, I don't see anywhere in the text where it says they just took it for granted. Uh, People were amazed, though, and by the end of this account, again, they are fearful. They aren't just impressed. Every one of the synoptics says, in some form or fashion, these people are afraid because they witnessed the power of the Lord, and that power was so intense, apparently. They're afraid of what they see, and they they probably are reflecting on what Jesus taught that even had a more powerful effect, which wasn't just, of course, the the, uh, physical healing, but the spiritual restoration. And so that's really where the the story goes. So we'll pick that up uh, tonight in Luke chapter 5. All right, let's have a prayer first before we begin. Father, we come to you thanking you for the many good things you do for us. We know as your, as your children, as your sons and daughters, that we rely on you in every way. And we take comfort in that, Father. We take comfort in that because we do live in a world that's uncertain, as it's always been uncertain. And we live lives, Father, that we can't always count on people or things or events, but we know we can always count on you. And whether it's 2,000 years ago as your son walked the earth, or tonight as we sit here in this room, we know that you're in charge and you're in control. And that surely through your son, because of his sacrifice, we have forgiveness of our sins. Your son came to this earth to provide for that. Your son came to this earth and healed. He healed people physically, but more importantly, Father, he healed people spiritually. And we think about that tonight. We think about those great lessons, those great lessons of faith. And we think about the evidence that's given to us for our faith, even to this hour. And we thank you for those things. We don't have to be sons and daughters of yours that simply follow blindly. We have good evidence, and we have good reason to believe in your son. And we thank you so much for your word that teaches us about him and about what you'd have to do for you in this world during our time. We pray for all this, Father, through your son's name. Amen. All right, so let's look at uh, Luke chapter 5. In terms of chronology, if you think back to two weeks ago, it, it does fit right along with where we came from. Luke, among the synoptics, really does try to follow things logically. And he says that at the outset, remember. Uh, He is teaching through words. uh, The most excellent Theophilus, remember, he refers to him again in the book of Acts, teaching this uh, Hellenistic person, this Greek, about why he can have the faith that he has. And he tells him in the Gospel of Luke, I'm telling you things, now pretty much we would say in our vernacular, correctly in an order. And so there's some chronological, you know, logic to this that you don't always find in the other two synoptics, and certainly not John. Um, So in Luke chapter 5, it comes directly after where we left off, which was two weeks ago, the healing of the man of leprosy. And so uh, right after that, we have this account, Luke chapter 5, I'm picking up in verse 17, it says, Luke tells us, that one day Jesus was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there, who had come from every village in Galilee and Judea, and from Jerusalem. So, and the power, we're told, of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. It's a pretty good setting. And we're told in verse 18, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in 
and to set him down in front of the Lord. But we're told in verse 19, they can't find a way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof as a consequence and let him down through the tiles with a stretcher. That's where the little kids love the story, right? So you're lowering him down. Little boys love that, right? Little boys, they're, they're not engineers. They're deconstructionists. They just want to tear things apart. And so open a hole, as Mark tells it to us, digs a hole. They dig a hole in the roof because that's how you make roofs back then. They have some sort of tile like we would think of it. And they make enough of a hole to lower this man on a pallet, this paralytic, through that right in front of the Lord. So in verse 19, it says, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, let him down through the tiles with a stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. So get a picture of that in your mind. It's one of those stories we've read over so many times, we've heard so many times, it's sort of here and gone. Yeah, of course, Jesus heals the paralytic. You know, you think about how dramatic this would have been. You know, in Matthew and Mark's account, it reinforces that there's so many people, you couldn't even get through the door. Of course, we know so many people come, through, come to the Lord at points. People are stepping on each other. At another point in the gospel accounts, we're told they don't even have time to eat. And so here, there's so many people. And who's there? The Pharisees and the teachers. Because they are most concerned about what Jesus has to say. Why, do you suppose? Why are the Pharisees and teachers there seemingly camped out? Nobody else can hardly get in. But it, the text makes it appear like it's from at least me to Simon. That they are, they are sitting down and they're, they're listening. Why? They want to catch him in his own words, Glenn. That, that's how the text puts it many times, catch him in his own words, which is really, you know, a fool's errand. And almost literally here, a fool's errand when they, you think about how they approach him. Not to be too hard on him, but they, they are trying to catch him in his words. He is the word incarnate. You're not going to catch him in anything other than you're going to hear about the truth right? You're not catching him in anything. And so they're there to listen to see, is there any opening that they can attack? And what's the obvious reason why? Why are these Pharisees and teachers trying to lay a trap, or at least try to catch him in his words? They've come from everywhere. What's Jesus been dealing to this point, or doing to this point in the story? Even through the few classes we've seen, what's Jesus been doing? Yeah, and he's going to get to it again, isn't he, Jack? Right here in this story, it comes down to the central question of authority. The Pharisees don't want to let go. The teachers prize the law, and they knew it. Remember, the teachers of the law back then are serious about this. As Again, as the text tells us, they know every movement of the pen across the page to write down the law, every jot and tittle, as they would say. So they knew the law. Remember, that is never the question about the Pharisees and scribes. They knew that law. The question is, how are they going to apply it? And the question is, could they really perceive what the prophets had written and what God had intended through the ages to bring this moment to pass, that truly that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God? Most, it appears, don't accept that. Some do. We know that some do, but some don't. And here they sit close to him. They're listening. So in Mark's account, Mark chapter 2, Mark says that Jesus is teaching the Word. It's one of those places in Mark chapter 2 you wish Mark wouldn't have such a brief account would expand a little bit. But in Mark chapter 2, in the parallel account, one of the parallel accounts, Mark says he's teaching the Word. And so Jesus is there teaching. And there's a crowd there. What, what else has Jesus been doing other than like Jack said, he is teaching about authority and speaking about that. How is he proving that? Healing. Healing people. And again, for some people, it's the circus has come to town and I want to see the next act. For other people, this is the power of God and they're, they're starting to believe in that. Or they do believe in it. But that attracts a crowd, which goes back to one of the central points of all this, which is, why does Jesus come and heal? And it's to prove who he is, Right? And what's another reason? Not just to prove, hey, look, I am the Son of God. Let me show you. Like I told you about hitting a baseball 500 feet. You wouldn't believe me unless I did it and did it multiple times. Jesus heals. He heals multiple times. That does show his authority. But why else is he healing? Yes, and that goes almost to authority, but certainly him as Son of God, to inspire belief, right? Right? 
here's the proof positive, why else? Don in the communion meditation this morning spoke powerfully of Jesus as both God and man. Don't forget his humanity. If you see, how many people would you like to heal if you could? If you could, think about just one person right now. If you know one, you know five. If you know five, you know ten, and so on and so forth. If you could, how many people would you heal? Would you stop at your friends? Would you stop at your relatives? Or when you drove through Temple Terrace and saw somebody that was clearly in need or hurting, would you stop and help them if you knew you could? You're good people. You would. What's the word that summarizes that? What's Jesus have within him that we're supposed to imitate? He suffers with us. In other words, what? Compassion. Uh, It's his heart of compassion. So yeah, academically speaking, just in terms of doctrine or establishing authority, yes. Heal to show who I am. Heal to show my authority. Why is that important? So that we can be saved. Yeah, we got that one. But don't forget the, the compassion. This man's dropped through the ceiling, lowered through the, not quite dropped, lowered through the ceiling of this, of, of this structure. And that would have taken effort. They had to dig through that roof, separate the tiles, lower the man through the roof, right down the middle of Jesus as Jesus is teaching. I don't know. We'll never know what his immediate reaction was, facial expression or anything else. Uh, But he's impressed, isn't he? Uh, Look forward. Jesus is impressed at what they've done. Verse 18 again in Luke's account, chapter 5, says those men are carrying the bed. The man's paralyzed, can't find any way. Verse 19, went up on the roof, lowers him down through the middle of the crowd or into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Verse 20, what is Jesus' reaction since he's so impressed? Get up and walk, right? No. Not immediately. Verse 20, what what are the words that are written there? In almost, I think, every single English translation. What's he notice about these men? Before sins are forgiven. Kevin. Yeah, their their faith. I don't think anybody has anything different. Uh, I, I checked. I don't think there's anything different in English translations. It says, seeing their faith. It doesn't say he just felt bad for the guy who was a paralytic. It didn't say, certainly didn't say, this guy has sin in his life, and it's evidenced by him being a paralytic. That's nowhere taught by Jesus in the Bible. In fact, he contradicts what their traditional thinking was, right? Remember the man born blind? Who sinned? This man or his parents? And remember what Jesus said? Neither one sinned. This is happening to magnify or manifest the glory of God. Here what's happening. This man's lowered down right in front of Jesus in the middle of this crowd with the scribes and Pharisees sitting close. No air conditioning. We don't know exactly what time of year it is, but it would would have felt pretty close in there. You've been in a crowded room, and here comes this person in front of you, and those three guys, or however many there were, right, up on the roof, and Jesus sees their faith and is impressed. And his next move is not to heal the man. The next move he makes is, he says in verse 20, seeing their faith, he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And that's what sets off the rest of the story. Your sins are forgiven. I I, I don't think, I don't know how many people are in here, 60, 70 people, I don't think any one of us, if we didn't know the story, say you heard it for the first time, would have guessed that that would have been Jesus' initial reaction. Because he is, a, he is a man, right? God in flesh, but a man with compassion and great compassion. Surely the first thing he would have done with someone on pallet before him that's paralyzed would have been to, to raise him, right? You can walk again. That's not what he does. He's impressed by their faith. Don't forget... We tend to forget this because we move through quickly through the text because we've read it before. What's Jesus able to do that we can't do? Sometimes we act like we can do it, but what can he do that we can't do with people? Yeah, I can see their hearts. Frankly, I hate to say this some days, but most days I don't. I'm glad I can't do that. How hard would it be to know what people's hearts really say. 
Why would that be difficult? Because, you know, granted, that would help you perhaps know where someone is in their faith and how to reach them. That's the good part. That's how Jesus used that. How difficult would it be to walk up some, to someone and know what they're thinking, know what's in their heart? Why would that be a bad thing? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe a great, great gift to have, but how would that throw you off? Would it? If you walked up to somebody and you knew what they were thinking before they said anything, yeah, how many people would enjoy that every day of the week? Why? I'll tell you for me, it would distract me to no end. Because what, what do people do? What's in their heart, does that always come out of their mouth? No way. Do people hold back things all the time, and sometimes for good reasons? I, I mean that, sometimes for good reasons. They think they're doing the right things. But what? It's going to be a terrible distraction. Jesus has the ability, the clear ability, to read people's hearts. John makes that very clear early on in the Gospel of John, that Jesus knew what was in the hearts of men. He didn't need anybody, to paraphrase John. Jesus didn't need anybody to say, hey, look, I really need to tell you what Joe's thinking because, you know, not that Joe, any Joe. Joe's thinking because you need to know. Now, Jesus already knew. And so here, he perceives their faith. He doesn't have to guess. It took great faith, think about it, to get up on that roof. What would that have taken? A ladder, right? Then to get the the hole dug in the roof, and then to pull the tiles apart, then to lower that man down, which tells me they have rope or something they've carried up there, and then they've got to lower them down. You know, what's the chance? I mean, they've got to believe that Jesus is actually going to be able to heal this man, their good friend. And so he's, he's impressed by all that. And so he sees their faith, and he says, your sins are forgiven. In most accounts, when you read the Gospels, when it comes to the point of physical healing, Jesus makes a spiritual application, and most times the spiritual application comes first. And in every case, he puts the spiritual application at some point uh, within the teaching. You know, it's interesting to me that that is the way it happens, but it's logical and it makes good sense or it should to us even today. If you're a paralytic or you're able-bodied, if you are broken spiritually, where are you, right? We know that. That's hard for us to see past because, remember, we're physical people living in a physical world bound by physical constraints with physical bodies that eventually break down. And so we're consumed at trying to make our physical bodies better. Many times, what we eat, how we exercise, nothing wrong with, I mean, you're supposed to be a good steward of what you have. Nothing wrong with those things. But we get consumed by that if we're not careful. Jesus, time and again, emphasized the spiritual, right? Don't don't forget about the spiritual. The spiritual application comes first. And here he literally just puts it right in front of people. Your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and Pharisees are right there. What's the text tell us? The scribes and Pharisees say, no, they don't. Scribes and Pharisees are thinking things. And again, Jesus can perceive what they're thinking. All three of the synoptics put it pretty much the same. In Luke chapter 5, verse 21, it says the scribes and Pharisees began to reason. In verse 22, it says Jesus was aware of their reasonings. In Mark chapter 2, In verse 6, we flip there real quick, Mark chapter 2, verse 6, after Mark tells us they've dug the hole, the friends did, and then let down the pallet. In verse 6, it says the scribes are sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark chapter 9, the third of the synoptic accounts, it's the same, it's the same way. Mark, or Matthew chapter 9, verse 3, it says the scribes were saying to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. Verse 4 in Mark, sorry, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus knows their thoughts and, say, and says, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? It's similar in every case. They don't have to voice it. He knows what they're thinking. And not just what they're thinking, but what's in their hearts. 
And if you want another constant in Jesus' teaching, what's he go back to time and again? Yes, the spiritual application always comes first. The heart is what matters, right? Remember, when people thought about, you know, can I eat this food? Can I eat that food? What's the old law say? We got to stay, as they would say today, kosher, to put it in a modern term, in an orthodox term for Judaism. They're worried about what they're putting in their body. They want to be right before God, right? going back to the Mosaic Law. How's Jesus change all that? It's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean, and it's eliminated, he says. What's he say? It's not about what goes into your mouth and what, how you consume things that way. What, what really matters? What comes out of your heart? Because from your heart, what? Your actions. Anybody else notice before you, ever, before you ever decide to do something, you had to think about it. Unless, unless there is a problem, some people have that problem, but it's not normal. I mean, people try to treat it because it's so abnormal. Usually people think before they act. Mature people. Babies, immature people don't always do that. But mature people, a thought has to go through the mind, Right? And usually that thought, increasingly, seems like, as you grow older, emanates in the heart. If you're in love, and a lot of you have been in love, if you haven't been in love, see me later. I'll try to help you with that, give you a little dating advice, maybe. Uh, But if you've fallen in love, especially if you've been married, where'd those feelings start? Start somewhere in your heart. What hurts the most Something you eat or something that breaks your heart. I mean, it doesn't take long to figure this stuff out. And Jesus knows their heart. What's coming out of their heart is instructing what they say. They're thinking evil in their hearts, he says. Why is it evil? What what are they doing when they say, you know, this fellow blasphemes. No one can forgive sins but God alone. How's that evil? They're saying in this case that Jesus is not the Son of God, and God ain't God in this case. And Jesus correctly identifies this as evil. They don't accept him for who he is. And so they're thinking evil in their hearts, and Jesus counters that with, okay, you want proof, I'll give you proof, right? And so they're thinking evil in their hearts. How hard is it to root out stuff from your heart? Think again back into your own lives. I know for me, before I was baptized, before I was converted, I was, a lot of you know, I was 25. You know, I was raised to be a good Methodist. I was a good little Methodist guy. And uh, I was in the service. I did a lot of other things. And when I was 25, I was converted. And there's a lot of things I wish I would have done differently before I was 25. Probably wasted a lot, if it did, waste a lot of good years. But there's a lot of things that need to be rooted out. But it doesn't matter if you were converted in a mature age or if you were converted when you were 11, 12, or 13. At some point, at some point, you've got to recognize there's things in my heart that need to be rooted out. There are things in my life that need to change. I really need to be truly converted, changed, right? Repent and become more like the Lord, the best I can. That takes is we're we're real quick to just throw it out there. We don't want to think about we don't usually think about what we're saying. It takes a literal change of heart. Without that change of heart, the actions will never change. Without the change of heart, you can get baptized every day. It's not going to really matter. Your actions won't change. Your words won't change. Your thoughts won't change. So you have to have that change of heart. It's become so commonplace for us to say we forget how powerful that is. That's why it's so hard to change the way people think. You're getting into what they really believe. You're getting into what's in their heart. Jesus is, if you want to think about it this way, Jesus is trying to break into the hearts of men with his teaching. And one way to do that is to give proof. Why should I believe that you're the Son of God? Why should I believe that you have the authority to forgive sins? One way to break into men's hearts is to give that physical proof. And still, some will not believe. And even beyond the point of the resurrection, they won't believe. There's too much on the line for them to lose 
physically in this world for them to confess that they were wrong. And so they won't believe. They're insistent on it. Some people's hearts won't be changed. That, that is the key to the text, to understand what Jesus is after here. He's after people's hearts. That's why he teaches the way he does, right? You need to have soft hearts. Don't have a hard heart that can't be opened by the Word. Let your heart be soft. Pray for a softened heart so the Word will be implanted and you'll be changed. Well, here he's trying to change hearts. And so, in this case, he performs this miracle. First, forgiving the man's sins. Now, it's interesting to me. Jesus takes his time, in every one of these accounts, takes his energy, takes his patience. How patient did Jesus have to be? Usually we pick on the apostles with this, and we should. They're around him the most. But I think we probably would have been just as difficult had we lived 2,000 years ago. How patient do you have to be to teach anybody anything? Who's, who's taught in here? Raise your hand. How patient do you have to be? Why? Part, Jack? That's right. And especially in spiritual teaching, Jack said that people want to believe what they want to believe, to summarize. And you have to be patient and try to get them to the point of realization that there is a different way to think here, to change their hearts on that. If you've taught anything from 2 plus 2 equals 4 to a little kid riding a bike, it takes a lot of patience. Uh, it's easy to lose patience. I mean, I know how to do this. Why can't you do this? And we're tough on people sometimes because we just aren't patient with them. It takes immense patience of the Lord to really try to reach people and teach people. You think about that. Again, that goes to the humanity of the Lord. And Don referenced Jesus falling asleep in the back of the boat this morning, right? Because it had been a long day, and he's tired. Think about how much energy and how much patience, how much literal blood, sweat, and tears goes into his ministry. And so that, that's what he's putting into things here. And he does come last. If you look at the text, that, that is clear. Before this story starts, look at Luke chapter 5. It's fit between two accounts. But in Luke chapter 5 and verse 16, I, I referenced this two weeks ago, it says he often slipped away to pray. You have to slip away when you have to steal time for yourself. He didn't walk away from people and say, hey, look, no time for you right now. I need to pray. You don't see that one time in the gospel accounts. And so I'm saying all that because the effort that this takes shouldn't be overlooked. And we shouldn't just kind of flippantly say, well, he's the son of God. He can read hearts. This is easy for him. Huh. This takes immense patience. It takes a lot of time and energy. And here, he's going to make the point with these people, especially the ones sitting close to him, it appears, those scribes and Pharisees. Yes, indeed, who you're dealing with here has the authority to forgive sins. And so, verse 20, your sins are forgiven. Scribes and Pharisees reason in their hearts, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Why else would they doubt him? I know, they've got things to lose. Pharisees don't want to lose their authority, don't want to lose their followers. Scribes don't think that this should be the way it is. They've got a preconceived idea, which gets to what Jack said. They already think that they're right, and they want to believe what they want to believe. Those scribes know the law. They know the prophecies. Why do they doubt Jesus? Where's he from? Where is Jesus from? Where's his hometown? He's from Galilee, the region. But even here it says you know, he's going to Capernaum, which is sort of his adopted town, because they don't accept him, remember, in Nazareth. He's born in Bethlehem. He's raised in Nazareth. So what? Where is Messiah supposed to come from? A little country town in Galilee? That can't be. It cannot be that this country rabbi come into town is some sort of savior? There's no way. That can't be. You can see where their questioning would come from. There's no way. And just like today, 
there would have been some difference, some difference in dialect. There would have been some difference in how they put things. Can you tell people that are from the city, from people from, that are from the country, even today, rural and urban? Or how about people from the Northeast, from people from, uh, you know, uh, God's favored land, you know, the Southeast? Can you tell the difference? You know, I mean, as soon as they opened their mouths, and we know that from the latter part of the gospel accounts, when Peter's questioned, but we know you are with them, you speak like a Galilean. And so, but from the time Jesus opens his mouth, from where he's from, of course they're questioning. No, this can't be. That's why they're sitting close. What's he saying? How is he saying it? Let's try to catch him, because surely this guy can't be the Savior. We don't know what this is, but it's not that. And so they're predisposed not to believe, and Jesus is trying to break through these hearts. So, their sins are forgiven, and they're reasoning. Jesus, in verse 22, says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? In verse 23, in Luke chapter 5, he concludes things, or he uh, moves on with things this way. And he asks them, which is easier to say, or which is easier, sorry, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. So, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he turns to the paralytic, or looks down at him, we're not sure. I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. And immediately, in verse 25, Immediately, the paralytic gets up from before them. Remember, there's a crowd, the Pharisees, the teachers, so many people he can't get through the door. Immediately, he got up before them and picked up what he had been laying on and went home glorifying God. He's a paralytic. From birth, we don't know. From an accident, we don't know. All we know is he's on a, he's on a bed. He's on a, mat, he's on a pallet. He is reliant on his friends who love him, who care for him, who sacrifice for him, who put their, put their energy into this, who went up the side of that building, lowered him down through a roof, and there he is at the feet of Jesus of Nazareth, and he's hearing these things. And then eventually he hears this, get up, pick up your pallet, pick up your bed, and go home. Can you imagine? I, I don't know what that would feel like. The only thing I can roughly equate it to, and if you wear glasses, you know this, the only thing I can roughly equate it to is when I first put on a pair of glasses, I was in the fifth grade, and if you wear glasses, you know this. You don't know that you don't see all that well until you wear glasses. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'll never forget. I was 10, and I went like this the whole way home. Anybody else do that as a kid? It's like, it's 3D. I can't believe it. And immediately, I realized why I was such a terrible hitter, right? I couldn't see the ball. That was my excuse. Uh, so the idea is what? Jesus transforms, but it's more than that. It's more than just, oh, I can see better. It's like, I couldn't have seen it all. And immediately, it's full color 2020 vision. Here it's this man couldn't walk. He's completely dependent on others. Yeah, I'd say he's glorifying God. So he gets up, incredibly happy, glorifying God, and goes home. Think about how Jesus puts this. Why are you reasoning in your hearts? How do I break through that? How do I, how do I make these people believe? How do, I, how do I give them evidence? Well, he knows how to do that. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or pick up your pallet and walk? Either one. Either one of those things is a form of words. Your sins are forgiven or pick up your pallet and walk. The first thing's more important. Your sins are forgiven. But if you don't believe I can do that, if you don't think I have the authority to do that, which is easier? So I'm going to tell this man he's healed. And he does. He picks up his stretcher. He goes home. And the key is what? The key is the authority. How does Jesus have the authority to do this? This country rabbi, remember. Remember how Nathaniel put it in the Gospel of John. Nazareth? Remember his question there? What, what, what did he say about Nazareth? Anybody remember? What good thing can come out of Nazareth? It's no accident. That's where Jesus comes from. Obviously, it's no accident at all. The least, maybe the least likely place for those people to think about the Savior coming from, and here he is from Nazareth. And so surely this can't be the guy. And yet Jesus is saying, 
I do have the authority to do this. I do have the authority to do this. And I'm going to show you why or how I have that authority. If I have the power to forgive sins, and surely you know, I can tell this man to get up and take his pallet up and walk so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. I think it was Glenn that said, and I think you're referencing John, you know, he is doing these things to inspire faith. Now, again, I'll go back to the matter of compassion. Why is he being so patient? Nobody in here knows, and we will never know what it was like to be the Lord. I can't even approach that. God, wrapped in flesh, the Word incarnate, living among men and women, living a physical life, just like we live, except with all, all the modern technology, getting tired, getting put out some days, having to deal with people the way we deal with people sometimes. Can you imagine all that? And so here he is, trying to break into the hearts of men, using what he has at hand, which is his power. Right? And he always ascribes what he does to the Father. So he knows where all things come from. He, he slips away to pray. He prays in such a compelling way that his apostles want, them to, want him to teach them how to pray, remember? So why does he do that? Yeah, he wants to inspire faith. Why? That heart of compassion. Why should I care so much that I take the pa- or make patience, or make patience, that I become patient enough to do this, that I overcome the natural impatience that I would have? That, that would make all of us say, what's the matter with you people? Why aren't you getting it yet? He, I'm sure, has to overcome that from time to time. Why, why can't you understand this yet? And why does he take the time and energy? But that he cares enough that he wants people to be saved, to be home with the Father, to be home with him. And so, so that you may know, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. If you neglect that one, if you object to that authority, you don't have a home in heaven. And that's where people are today, right? And that's pretty much where people are today. You have a choice. You can accept that Jesus has authority, that Jesus actually came to the earth, that Jesus still wields authority as king, or you don't have to. God respects us enough as individuals, as his created beings, made in his image, that we can make that choice. With all the evidence at hand, we can either decide to believe or not to believe our choice. And Jesus is trying to, not so subtly, help people make that choice. And so he's impressed by their faith, right? That's what we're told, these men. He's struck by the reasoning in the Pharisees' hearts, the teachers' hearts there. And it probably strikes him too, the conclusion that they drew, who can forgive sins but God alone? I mean, how ironic, right? Because this is God in flesh there before him. So, with all that, uh, they have their answer right before them. It, 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 the question is, do they accept it or not? Whether they accept it or not. And so, the healing of the man, the healing of the paralytic, he's just trying to confirm who he is. Right? So, whether a healed body or a healed soul, uh, that's what Jesus is all about, that compassion. Get up, take up your bed, and go home. Life is possible. And again, I'll go back to uh, what Glenn had referenced, that compassion, uh, that trying to inspire faith. If you've forgotten the latter part of John, don't forget about it. In chapter 20 and 21, where John reiterates why Jesus comes to the earth and why he does what he does. So many things I could have written down, John said, but I write these things so that you may believe. And through your belief, have life. Not just believe so that God can be happy with that, but so that you can have life. What's the reaction before we quit here? We've got just a few minutes, but think about the, think about the reaction of the people here. Uh, look at the end of Luke's account, and we'll look at the other two synoptics. Uh, looking again at verse 25 in, in Luke chapter 5. The text tells us that immediately the paralytic got up from before them, Again, the crowd all around him picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. In verse 26, 
It says they, that would be the crowd that's there, were all struck with astonishment. I don't think it was lost on anybody. You couldn't have missed people up on the roof, right? And you would have heard them digging. And then you would have seen the, the person being lowered down, and now you're seeing him walk out with his pallet. They see what's happening. They're struck with, my version has, astonishment in verse 26. And they began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things here today. I I noted this a couple weeks ago. The other two accounts, Matthew and Mark, give similar language. They're filled with fear. They're astonished. Again, remember, why are they afraid? What should this impress on us? Jesus didn't come to make people afraid, per se. What he does should inspire holy reverence and fear, but why the fear? Why is it so fearful to be in the presence of the Lord in this case? Yeah, he would know their heart too. Yeah, that that would would put me in a fearful state some days, right? Hard to guard everything that's coming into your heart. Why else? He's showing the power to heal this man. Awe-inspiring? We overworked the term awestruck or awesome. We just, we've overworked that to know just to the nth degree in our society. Something's awesome or awestruck. Awe goes, that word goes to the nature of fear. When you are in awe, there is an element of fear there, right? Why? You, you think back. Think back into even the Old Testament. When people come into the presence of angels, when they come into the presence of God, remember, I think I mentioned this in here, what is the natural reaction of people if they have any sense about them at all? They get into the presence of an angel or of God. What is their natural reaction? And they fall down. They hit the deck. Remember, I gave you the example in here of Jesus in the garden and those people coming out to arrest them. They're the ones with the weapons. They're the ones with the lanterns. They're the ones who have the physical license to come out and arrest Jesus. And yet when Jesus says, here I am, arrest me, let these others go, they ask, you know, you know effectively, are you Jesus? I am Jesus. The text says he simply says, I am. They drop back and fell to the ground. Here, these people are awestruck. They're filled with fear. Jesus didn't come to scare people to death, and that's it. That's not the lesson. But the lesson is these people have seen something that is just absolutely incredible that they just can't believe, and it does scare them. Who can wield this kind of power? Look at Mark's account, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, it's very, very similar. Uh, Jesus, Mark chapter 2, verse 8, Jesus was immediately aware in his spirit that the Pharisees were reasoning the way they were And he asks them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk, and then tells them, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He tells the paralytic to get up, pick up your pallet and and go home, and immediately picks up his pallet, walks out in the sight of everyone, Mark tells us. New, the uh, New American Standard puts it this way in verse 12 in Mark 2. The man got up, immediately picked up the pallet, and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying that we have never seen anything like this. Matthew is very similar. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, the shortest of the accounts of this. Jesus told the man in verse 6, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. He got up and went home. And verse 8 says, The crowd saw this. They were awestruck. That's the word that goes directly to fear. They glorified God who had given such authority to men. Yeah, this is different. People are starting to recognize. It's a huge crowd here. We don't know how many. But people are starting to recognize this is just not another country rabbi from Galilee. This isn't just somebody that's doing interesting things. We've heard about this. Now we're seeing it. And they are, they are indeed awestruck, and they're fearful. What else can happen with Jesus of Nazareth? And should I truly believe that he's the Son of God? 
does he have the authority to forgive sins? Well, he seems to have proved it here, hasn't he? Those people 2,000 years ago, again, we tend to forget this, they had the same choices we do. We tend to fixate on the scribes and Pharisees. The apostles had choices. 11 out of the 12 got it right. But even one that followed him closely for over three years got it wrong. So everybody has choices. And these people are given plenty of reason by Jesus to believe in him. So, all right, Jonathan will teach you on Wednesday night from John 4. And on uh, next Sunday, I'll be back with you. So hope you have a good week. Appreciate you being here.
Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you're here tonight. We're going to begin worshiping our God with Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise the Good evening to you all. What a wonderful time it is to be able to come together to study the Lord's Word, understand more about His will for our lives. I pray that you are benefited from your class and that you know the mind of God better as a result of studying His Word. That's always a wonderful benefit that comes from meeting together again on Sunday evening. To be quite honest with you, I, nothing newsworthy happened this afternoon that I'm aware of, and so I really don't have uh, any announcements to add to what Don said this morning. But I do want to take a moment to make sure that I point this out to you. Coming up in less than two weeks, we're going to have our uh, weekend in the Word. And we have these flyers back there, uh, back on the vestibule, underneath the, the screens in the foyer. I really want you, if you will, to go pluck one of those out and take a look at it. We have such an amazing weekend coming forward, full of wonderful speakers and wonderful topics. And it's well worthy of your time. When you, when you open this up and when you look at what's on the slate, there's sure to be something that's going to be beneficial to you, beneficial to your family, beneficial to your walk with the Lord. And so I encourage you to take one of those, to look at those, to mark down uh, the classes that are, that are of interest to you, and to do your best to be here in two weeks, September 9th through 11th. We're going to have our weekend in the Word. We're going to talk about authentic discipleship, something that's extremely important, I know, 
to all of us. So please make sure you grab one of those. Make sure you mark your calendar and you're ready for that weekend in the Word. Those are all the announcements that I have. Uh, if you'll be standing, we'll have a closing song. We'll be dismissed. Be with me, Lord. God, we do ask at this time that you be with us, each one of us here, Father, that you give us strength and that you wrap your healing arms around each one of us and protect us from Satan and for his uh, power and his temptation that he would have at us, Father, to pull us away from you and from this church family, Father. We know that we are so blessed to be your children and to be a part of this family here tonight and for each one, Father, from the youngest to the oldest one here, Father, we're so thankful for their influence and their encouragement that it brings to each one of us. For the Bible classes, we can be a part of, Father, that we are here to learn more about you, and we pray that we will take those lessons with us throughout this week, that we will use them in defense against Satan, and that we will use them to bring glory that is due you and honor that is due you and to shed our light around us for each of our spheres of influence, Father, that we will be lights unto them in, in any capacity that we can, Father. Use us, mold us, and continue to guide us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>